Hello and welcome to Critical Care Fundamentals. These lectures are meant to be brief and the goal is to give you, the busy provider, a basic framework of common critical care topics. My name is Frank Lodicerto and I completed a combined internal medicine and pediatric residency and then went on to do two fellowships in both adult and pediatric critical care. I currently work in both the adult and pediatric critical care units at Geisinger Medical Center and the Janet Weiss Children's Hospital in Danville, Pennsylvania. I also serve as the program director for the Adult Critical Care Fellowship. Today's topic is the approach to acute respiratory failure. Our learned objectives are to number one, name the causes of acute respiratory failure, and number two, be able to describe shunt physiology. I'm going to quickly go over our four causes of acute respiratory failure, but you may notice that it may be different than what you've read in the textbook. You may see type one, hypoxemic respiratory failure, type 2, type 3, type 4. While these are nice for categorization of respiratory failure, my approach is more of a practical bedside approach to caring for acutely ill patients. Let's go through each one, then we'll take one by one separately to describe. Number one, increased work of breathing. Number two, refractory hypoxemia. Number three, airway protection. Number four, apnea and hypopnea. Now, number three and number four usually require intubation, as if the patient is not protecting their airway, the use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is not going to be recommended, or if the patient is um, apneic and not breathing at all. Likely, these patients are going to be need needing intubation. Now, the first two, increased work of breathing and refractory hypoxemia, um, they may respond to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in the form of high flow nasal cannula, CPAP, or even BiPAP. I won't be discussing these here, but in future podcasts we may discuss these. Now you also may note that patients are intubated electively. I'm not going to be discussing indications for elective intubation. All right, so the first category is increased work of breathing. Now this again is somewhat subjective. However, what I look for are three separate signs. If these patients have these signs, um, they may be on the verge of respiratory arrest. First, I look at tachypnea. And I look at the type of tachypnea. Now, all patients would probably likely be breathing fast uh, with increased work of breathing. But if their chest rise is very shallow and rapid, these are the patients that get me most worried, as, opposed, as compared to those with um, uh, good chest excursion or good chest rise and rapid breathing. And I'll tell you why. Those with short, shallow tidal volumes um, are more likely to have neuromuscular weakness, bronchospasm. So it's always important to listen and auscultate to your pa patients uh, and see if they're having uh, no air movement at all or, or diffuse wheezing. And there's also going to be a problem with compliance. Now, I talk about compliance in other episodes um, and basics of mechanical ventilation. So please refer to those to talk more about compliance. But it may be decreased pulmonary compliance from a number of things like pulmonary edema, pneumonia, contusions, or atelectasis. It could be decreased thoracic compliance or decreased abdominal compliance. Now, there are also some miscellaneous categories like upper airway obstruction. And as I mentioned, now patients may be tachypnic and demonstrate increased work of breathing. Um, with patients with high metabolic demands. Now, their chest rise is going to be, for the most part, with some exception, a lot different. They may have large tidal volumes and rapid breathing because if, if these patients have a severe metabolic acid, they're trying to get rid of CO2 and neutralize their pH. Or they may be in, the state, of, in a state of shock where they're trying to increase metabolic uh, supply. The other thing that I look for is tachycardia and specifically diaphoresis. When I see tachycardia and diaphoresis, what that tells me is this patient has high catecholamine surge and they're on the verge of, of, of some catastrophe in this setting, likely respiratory arrest, where catecholamines are released causing tachycardia and diaphoresis. When you see a patient who's diaphoretic, you should always be worried. Number two is refractory hypoxemia. And what I specifically mean here is shunt physiology, and specifically intrapulmonary shunt. There is also a category of intracardiac shunting, which we'll not be talking about here. And I'm going to explain intrapulmonary shunting in just a minute. But here we're seeing adequate perfusion to the lungs. However, there's inadequate ventilation. So there's good blood supply. However, there's poor gas exchange. This could be secondary to junk in the alveoli, so to speak, like water from pulmonary edema. 
pus from a pneumonia, or blood from a pulmonary contusion, or the, al the alveoli themselves may be collapsed in, in the setting of atelectasis. So let's talk a little bit about shunt physiology. This is always something that confuses learners. Well, what do I mean about what, by shunt physiology? Well, what I mean here is that typically oxygen, oxygen will move or cross the uh, alveolar capillary gradient as I'm showing here, okay? It will be picked up as blood is pumped from the right side of the heart by hemoglobin and taken back to the left side of the heart. Now, if you have, let's say, pulmonary edema and there's fluid impeding gas exchange or diffusion, oxygen is not going to be able to uh, move across the alveoli into the capillary because of this pulmonary edema or pus or the, the alveoli may be collapsed or blood from a contusion. So these patients typically will need positive pressure ventilation. So if we put these patients on, let's say, CPAP or BiPAP or, or um, intubate, depending on the situation, what we're doing is increasing the surface area. We're increasing the surface area for gas exchange by giving them positive pressure, therefore allowing better gas exchange, oxygen, uh, to be able to diffuse across the capillary membrane and uh, increase or improve oxygenation. So, how do I approach someone with shunt physiology? Well, if I walk into the room and patient is hypoxemic and desaturating, I first put them on as, as much FiO2 as I can. So, for instance, I may, I may put them on 100% non-rebreather, which we know uh, is only about 70% uh, FiO2. But again, I put that on and I, and I see their response. Now, this is a, a, a nice graph that I have taken from... Um, a textbook of uh, critical care, Marino's textbook of critical care. And you can see as, as shunt physiology increases or there are more alveoli involved uh, with shunt physiology, upwards of about 50%, um, we'll see that as we add more and more FiO2, increase FiO2 and give them more and more oxygen, we see on the, on the x-axis, we see 100% FiO2 being delivered. But on the y-axis, there's no increase in PO2. There's no gas exchange. This means that this patient has refractory hypoxemia, and more than 50 to, or 40 to 50% of their lung is involved with shunt physiology. So here's my approach. I give them oxygen. If there's no response, that means they have greater than or equal to 40% of sh uh, shunt physiology. And these patients are likely going to need positive pressure ventilation. The third category is the inability to protect their uh, patient's airway. So what do I use? Well, I typically use pooling of secretions in the airway because what are we trying to protect the patient's airway from? We're trying to protect their airway from aspiration. So if they're pooling secretions in their airway and not mobilizing these secretions, well, they're likely uh, not protecting their airway and at risk for aspiration. Another useful bedside tool is if this patient can lift their head off the stretcher, they, they may have enough um, um, of strength and uh, uh, their mental status may be good enough to protect their airway. However, what I use mostly is pooling of secretions. Now, some use gag and cough, and, and some of the times the gag and cough are, are, are impaired. Now, a cough, I think, is, is very important. If a patient is coughing, they're likely protecting their airway, but they're not always reliable markers. Uh, another is a GCS, and um, uh, typically it's said that a GCS less than 8, you intubate. It almost rhymes, but that's not always true. You have patients who are chronically uh, uh, neurologically devastated and may have a low GC GCS, and, and, and that may not be the best test. So this is a, a, a tricky situation. However, um, if you use these two, two tools, are they pooling secretions on, in their airway? Um, or are they lifting their head off the bed? They're likely going to be able to protect their airway just fine. But again, if they're not, this, this situation usually requires intubation rather than the use of non-invasive positive pressure into, um, uh, ventilation. All right. And the fourth category is respiratory rest. They're apneic um, or hypopneic. What I usually look for in this situation is um, anything reversible. But first, let me tell you that in, in these patients, what happens is that the P, the alveolar CO2 rises and displaces the alveolar O2. Um, um, and this may happen if a patient has 
no perfusion in cardiac arrest, a severe CNS injury like a traumatic brain injury. Um, they can be hypoglycemic or, or from a drug overdose. This also can happen in shock with decreased cerebral perfusion. So what I first look for, is there any reversible causes? So uh, what are reversible causes? Well, hypoglycemia. So you can either check a uh, finger stick blood sugar level or, or empirically give dextrose and see if there's any improvement. Another is, is opiate overdose, so um, administering Narcan. And if it works, then you have a solution. Now, you may still have to intubate these patients. However, um, you would try a reversal agent first to see how they respond. The last one is uh, benzodiazepine overdose. Now, this um, um, there, there is an antidote, flumazenil. However, I've, uh, I, I use this uh, less often than, than Narcan. And the reason is that patients are on, um, uh, you don't, or you may not know if the patient is on chronic, chronic uh, benzodiazepines or has a seizure disorder. If they are on chronic benzo benzodiazepines or have a seizure disorder, you may want to avoid flumazenil. Now, uh, the, the instance I give flumazenil may be a benzodiazepine-naive patient who just took benzodiazepines. Now, this may be safe to reverse. But again, be very cautious before administering flumazenil. Well, I hope you enjoyed this lecture uh, on the causes of acute respiratory failure. Please join us next time.